That is such a great passage um, in Job chapter 23 or 26. I forget which one. What a good, great stuff. Tonight, uh, I want to get, get you to turn to Luke chapter 23, Luke 23 in your Bibles. And um, just like to walk you through some, maybe the most important philosophy. I don't know. How do you rate what is more important than another in the Christian life? Perhaps this would, if we got this right, it just might solve all the problems Christians have and certainly would solve all the problems in the world. Luke 23, our Savior's on the cross. Now, if you're a newer Christian, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of them is writing about our Lord's life for a purpose. And um, there's a reason some things are in one gospel and not in another. Matthew, for one thing, Matthew is written primarily to present Jesus as the king of the Jews. And that's where the kingdom parables are. Um, in the, and there's uh, genealogy because a king needs a genealogy. Well, in the book of Mark, they present Christ as the servant. And there's no genealogy because who cares about the genealogy of a servant? And, and so the, the view of each one is a little different. And uh, obviously they're all inspired. They're all from, from God. But you'll see some things. So I want to look at two verses in Luke, and then we'll look at one in John. But look at Luke chapter 23, and we're going to go down to verse 34. <clears throat> Our Lord's on the cross, and uh, we're going to read just some of the things that went on there. Let's stand together. <clears throat> As we read the text, Luke 23, Jesus has been crucified. And um, let's look at verse 33 and follow along as I read. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding and rulers also. Uh, can, you, can you just picture, and I know we've probably most of us seen stories in old westerns where there's a hanging or something. And you wonder, do people really gather to see someone suffer? And I just, you know, I don't want to see an animal suffer. And I don't mind shooting it or stepping on it. But, uh, you know, I don't, anyway, it's a hard thing to, to enjoy suffering. And uh, maybe, obviously, this crowd gathered around the, uh, the, the cross. And, and throughout the dark age, you read the testimony of millions of God's people who suffered. And they, um, people would come in crowds to watch a Christian burn. Stadiums filled with people to watch Christians fed to the lions. And it's very hard to understand that. Um, but, you know, is there no mercy in the hearts of God's people or the people around us for that matter? But um, in verse 34, Jesus then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding and the rulers also with them deriding him, saying he saved others. Let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God and and uh, we'll skip ahead to the two men crucified him in ver with him in verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly. That's a confession of his sin. Uh, that's, the big, that's the first step of salvation. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And there we have the second important thing. He acknowledged Jesus as a sinless Savior. Verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, this is the third part that's so key in regard to this man's destiny. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And let's pray. Lord, help us tonight, guide my thoughts. And these very simple thoughts, but so, so vital in this culture that we, in which we live. Uh, help my words to be appropriate, and uh, may, we, may we grasp truth that would change the way we live at home as well as the way we live through our ministry here. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. 
I'd like you to notice in verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive what? Them. He's speaking of a group, probably the nation of Israel, but certainly the leaders of the nation of Israel. He's speaking to a, a speaking about maybe those that nailed him to the cross, but philosophically and practically probably more to the people making the decisions. Um, in, verse 30, 40, in verse 43, he's talking to one. Jesus said unto him, singular, Verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And so you, he's, he's speaking to God, I want you to forgive this group, this nation, this nation's leaders, whatever it might be. Then he says to the one individual, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Keep your finger there and look over to the Gospel of John chapter 19, the very next book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 19, the same place, Calvary, there on the cross, and just as most of you know, um, as I said earlier, different things recorded for different reasons. But if you look at John chapter 19, <clears throat> John chapter 19, and look down at verse 27, well, let's go back to verse 25. Now there stood, John 19, 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And Jesus therefore, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, and that was John. It's interesting, John's the one who called John the disciple whom Jesus loved. But it is God's word, all right? So um, he says... To John, um, uh, woman, behold thy son. And he said to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Here we see this statement in verse 27. Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her home. Basically, he said, Mama, John's going to take care of you. And John, I expect you to pick up the baton and look after my mother because I'm not going to be here. Three statements, Father, forgive them. Second statement, today thou individually shall be with me. And the third statement, he says, um, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. And it's a, a family statement, um, looking after a widow, looking after the needs of someone who's older, not able to take care of themselves. Now, the thing that I want to point out tonight is this. There's seven statements in the cross, and you can study them. There's been lots of sermons. There's been books written on the seven statements in the cross. After this, he said, I thirst. After this, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? After this, he said, it is finished. After this, he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. But those four are geared toward himself. I thirst. Uh, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But the first three statements on the cross, if we have these right chronologically, were all about others. His first, look, you know, most of you, you live for others. You're generous, you're kind. I've been with our people in different places and folks use their money for others and they, they do things for others. We have, a, we have a, a church full of people who are servants and kind and, and generous. And, um, but... You know what? When you've got nails in your hands and your feet, it's awful hard to think about others. Um, you know, no lady, um, you know, 20 hours into labor is witnessing to the lady in the next room. Hey, lady, let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> you know, I'm going in for gallbladder surgery. Doc, while you're cutting on me, let me tell you about the greatest news I ever heard. And and, you know, nobody does that. When you're hurting, you think about you. And that's just us. That's humanity. But we're looking at the, the perfect Son of God on the cross. And this is as a perfect man would be. This is as God in the flesh would be. And we look tonight at these three statements. And again, there's nothing new I'm going to tell you tonight. I do just want to take a few minutes and point out these things. In, in John 19... He was concerned about his mother. He was, John 19, 30, 27, he's concerned about his mother. He's concerned about a widow. He's concerned about John looking after someone who's needy. 
Uh, look, this is John's going to be the, the pastor, uh, the preacher. He's going to be the one on power. He's going to be writing parts of the Bible. This guy needs to live the Christian life. And you better be focused on the widows and you better be focused on the needy and you better be paying attention to people that are hurting. If you're going to be the kind of disciple I want you to be, then you've got to keep this thing in mind. It was a, it was a philosophical thing as well as an immediate thing. There are no accidents with Jesus. It's just not randomly chosen these words. Back over to Luke, if you want to look there. In Luke chapter um, 23, verse 34, Jesus uh, said, uh, then said Jesus in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I, I've always thought, no, they knew just what you did. You don't put nails in a guy's hand without knowing. But he's thinking this nation had no idea. Remember later, um, uh, the Apostle Paul said, had they known these things, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They knew they were crucifying Jesus, but they didn't realize all the details. They didn't realize, and I think some did, some didn't. Remember, the, the, the soldiers, when he died, the soldiers looked up and said, surely this was the Son of God. But the idea was still a vague, drifting thing because Paul's the one who wrote back, looking back, saying if they'd have known, they wouldn't have done it. So... Jesus says, Father, forgive them. It's really hard for you to pray for God to forgive the people who hurt you. But it's very biblical. And we are in a culture that, that is, has got no clue of forgiving those who hurt them. I mean, I'll forgive you because you forgot to call me. I might forgive you. They had nails in his hands. They'd mocked him, stripped him naked, put him up on a cross. They ridiculed him. They humiliated him. Already, they'd already whipped him. His body was just flesh torn. A crown of thorns on his head. He was in pain beyond description. Many people, history says that many people died from the scourging as they hit that whip to a body and tore it back and tore the flesh off. There's occasions where bodies were literally torn in half. The bottom half of the body just fell to the ground while the top half was hanging. Um, they put him through that. Um, the, the emotional, the physical, the spiritual, the weight of the world was on him. Not only his father turned his back on him, not only his country turned his back on him, not only did his disciples run and hide and abandon him, on top of all that, he became sin. He literally became all of your sin. Take just this room. Take all the sin you and I have ever committed, all the sins that have ever been in thought or in deed, pile them all up, and that is one drop of the shame that he became. He became sin. It's a horrible time. And he says, uh, I would like you to forgive them. For humiliating me and no uh, and why can we not pray for our government can we not pray for a liberal and not pray that God kills him <laughs> you know if it would have been one of us on the cross we would have gotten off that cross and we would have put 10,000 crosses up put every one of them on it you know and said Shazam you'll never die you just hang there um had Jesus not said, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he wouldn't have died. He didn't, they didn't kill him. He gave his life. He said, no man taketh it from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to raise it up. No man takes my life from me. He was on that cross crucified, and he said, all right, I've done it. The sin debt's been paid. He cries out, it is finished. That's the seventh saying on the cross. And he was gone. And he left his body. And uh, just... But all of this, if you take a moment with me tonight, and let me just ask you to consider this simple thing. These first three sayings in the cross, they're all about others. All about others. If we focus our attention on our family and our career, on our children's education, if we build our life, what can I do to make money? And what can I do to get possessions? And what can I do to build up my retirement? And I don't want to take that job because there's no pension, which is like half the people in the room. But, you know, there are people who have pensions. They, they, how about that? We're all moving in with them when we get old. <laughs> um, 
there uh, and the, and you know what a lot of people be happy to have some of us maybe others not but um, if if we build if we make all of our decisions on my comfort my future my kids where are my kids going to go to school well I want them to go to school where they get a good job where they get a good uh, reputation where they're more likely to get into this position so they can have earthly security earthly rewards earthly pleasures you know what's really sad none of that's sinful except none of it has to do with what these three statements were these are all about others you know my wife and i delight that our youngest he's in utah tonight in salt lake city at a mormon church they've got money and uh, that our son decided to, if God opens the doors, uh, there he and his wife are going to Trinidad. I just figure we're going to be taking cruises to the Caribbean. And um, what a neat thing. Uh, tonight, Nathan Patton and his wife Marissa are drifting around the country, gathering up support so they can go to the Philippines. Um, what a wonderful thing that some of our own young people uh, are going willing to live in a third world country um you know i was watching some football highlights i, don't, I haven't watched any sports since since knucklehead started kneeling during the national anthem a year or two ago um but i, I do like sports and i was watching the famous football highlights and i just thought man that's the best part of football all the great plays and and um you know, just amazing athletes. I, I admire that part of them. They may be total animals, worthless husbands, but man, they're sports. But, but understand this, their career is about this long, and it is totally selfish. Totally. Look, you just think, you could take a famous musician that plays in concert halls or they could play in a church orchestra for Jesus. A famous singer uh, who records uh, songs uh, and makes albums and sells albums. Or they could be singing in a church choir. Uh, they, they could go down to the rescue mission. I know one guy, he said, um, before someone, and I, I don't know if their church has a rescue mission. I don't know all the details about it. But he said, before anybody stands in my pulpit to sing a solo, they will sing in the rescue mission. If they won't sing in the rescue mission, they can't sing in my pulpit. I thought, man, that's a good thing. If you're too good to sing to people on the street, you're not good enough to sing for God anywhere. This, it's the whole spirit is this spirit of others. See, there's a mistake that we get our lives so involved in the world around us. And obviously, we've got to eat, we've got to sleep, we've got to get to and from work. We, we, you know, we want our kids to at least be able to read and write and function. And by the way, our young people are not having problems getting jobs. The young people that grow up around here, I, I continue to be amazed at the jobs they get. I'll hear they're doing this or that. I think, man, that came from a little Christian school? You know, in a year of Bible college or two years of Bible college, and here you get this amazing job, and you're traveling around the world pre-COVID. Uh, now you're traveling around your house, <laughs> you know, doing zoom meetings from korea or to tibet or something and uh, you know what the the mistake that christians can make is we go to church listen to bible studies maybe study our own bible and listening this and we enjoy the teaching and the preaching of god's word and we try to live a basically good life and then we walk out and we forget james 1 27 that says pure religion is to visit the fatherless and the widows of their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You want know what real religion is? It's not sitting in here. You go visit the fatherless, you visit widows, and you keep unspotted from the world. Don't let this world spot you. I've got a, I've got a pin in my pocket, and I used earlier I wrote a, a something, I don't know what I wrote, offering envelope, and it was a, a clicker kind of pin, you know, and, and I, I put it in my pocket. I thought, oh, I'm getting that out of my pocket because I'm, I'm always pushing the click the wrong way putting it in my pocket and I get a spot right there and um you know then I gotta you know put hairspray peanut butter ice I don't know whatever it does I just give it to my wife and she takes care of it but we don't want a spot do we God says pure religion has no spots of that world out there you know for a 
churchgoer to forget that there are jails. It's not right. Now, we all can't do everything, but we sure ought to be concerned. People who have a, a surrendered life to others, they're not going to forget the rest homes. You know, this morning, I, after church, I sat in the parking lot talking to different people, and Josh Herb's over here trying to find one of his children. Just, just collect any two or three and take them. They're all close. And uh, he said, i got to get my daughter here. We're going to the rest home, bringing his kids to the rest home. And, and um, raising our children up, thinking about others. And again, we can't take our kids to the jails, but uh, I'll tell you that uh, the, the, the magician, them too, the, mu the musician who could play in church but because there's no glory, but they would play at a public concert or someplace they're paid to play. I don't know why God doesn't have your fingers fall off. Isn't he merciful? When he's on the cross and those people are making fun of him, I think, man, they, every one of them would choke to death on their spit. That's us. And he said, Father, would you forgive them? It's all about others. Nothing in our Lord's life was about him. Somebody said, I'll follow you wherever you want to go. He said, really? Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. I got nowhere to lay my head. And he went up in the hills and laid his head on the rock. Hmm. Others. Others. You know, you read the book of Job, you'll see that um, though he was rich and prosperous, read the story. And he said, I fed these people. These people ate at my table. The widows never were without as long as I was around, if I knew about it. Follow the life of Joseph, betrayed by his brothers, and he just became a servant. You know, it's just whatever I need to do, I'm going to do. And then he gets thrown in jail, and there he is in jail. He has done nothing wrong. He's been sold as a slave. He's been betrayed by his wife of his master. He was a slave. You know, he didn't have a bad attitude as a slave. He's in jail. And he notices butler and the baker come in from, the, from Pharaoh's house, and they're sad. He says, what's wrong, you guys? What can I do for you? He's in jail, and he's concerned about others. Maybe that's why he's one of the heroes in the Word of God. He wasn't calling his attorney saying, get me out of jail. Look at Daniel. You know, in Daniel, when the law was passed to kill all the, the, all the wise men in, in uh, Babylon, and, and Daniel, um, he goes to God and he finds the answer. Read the real wording when he calls the guy in charge, the, the not police, the soldier in charge. He said, don't kill the wise men. You know, he could have said, kill all of them. They're all a bunch of frauds, but we have the answer. But it wasn't about Daniel and his friends. It was about others. It was about all of them. And Daniel was one of them. Praise the Lord. When John said to his disciples, the, the John the Baptist now, not John that wrote the Gospel of John, John the Baptist in jail, and he was discouraged. You get discouraged when things go wrong. And he's in jail. And he says to his disciples, would you go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one we look for? Or should we look for another one? And in Luke chapter 7, in fact, look over to Luke 7. You might still be in Luke. If not, just listen. But if you want to look at Luke chapter 7, look at what Jesus said in response to John's disciples. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and go down to verse 21. Um, verse 20, Luke 7, 20. And when the men were come to him, from, to come to him, they said, John Baptist, I'm in John, Luke 7, 20. Um, John the Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Now, he could have said any number of things there, but look at what he said in response in verse 21. In the same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight, then Jesus answering said to them, go your way and tell John what things you've seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor, the gospel is preached. To the poor, the gospel is preached. You know, he could have said anything he wanted, but he, he took, now obviously his miracles were done to validate his authenticity as the Messiah, but 
He could have said, hey, watch me walk on the water. He could have said, watch me turn the water to wine. He could have said, hey, see that peanut butter sandwich? Watch me turn it into enough food for all of us. But you know what verse he quoted out of Isaiah? He said, the poor have the gospel preached to them. When Jesus chose a passage to identify his ministry, to validate his authenticity as the Messiah, every one of those things, everyone had to do with others. The miracles Jesus did, he cared about people. He was the widow walking out of town with her only son who died, and he raised him from the dead. You know, let's just take a quick minute and ask ourselves a question. And if you're listening online, ask yourself these questions. What did you do this week for others? Obviously, you ought to be a good wife. You ought to be a good husband. You ought to be a good parent. You should, of course, be a good employee, all those things. But did you, you know, to be honest, I should be a good husband because of God. But I'm flesh. I'm a good husband because I want her to be nice back. You know, I stopped at the store the day. She said, I just need one thing. I'll just run in and get it and come out. You can just wait. So I waited in the car. And she came out with something for our Bryce, our grandson's birthday party or whatever she had. And then she had this little haagen thing of double dark chocolate with brownies and fudge in it. And it was a personal size. It took me three different helpings to eat it, but I got it done. So I, I want her to like me, so she does things like that. So, I, I mean, I should be a good husband if she came out with Brussels sprouts, which I'm not going to eat. But uh, even if you dip them in chocolate, I'm not going to eat them. But you know what? Being a good husband isn't living for others. Being a good parent's not living for others. What did we do? Just ask it. Just look in the mirror. It's none of my business. I'm just asking. Tonight is a self-examination night. What have you done for others? How are you teaching your children to live for others? I mean, I think you ought to teach your children, don't leave your clothes on the floor. You're not making your mom pick up your dirty clothes. Now, just I'll say this as a suggestion. You lousy, sorry, rascal kid that you are so, so lame, your mom has got to pick up your clothes. That's what babies have. You want to be treated old, but you can't even put your socks in the back in the drawer. Where are we going tomorrow? <laughs> Others. Uh, you know, when our kids, now that our kids are grown, I don't care. But when our kids were little, I taught them, if there's only one food item left, don't take it. Because what if somebody comes, man, I just feel like a cookie. And they go in the cookie drawer, oh, it's empty. And now I take the last one all the time because everybody's grown. I'm not training anyone. <laughs> They're all ruined. It's, you know, but there were all kinds of things. You you ask God about your home. You that are raising kids, what can you do in your home to teach your children to think about others? And I don't care if it's putting things away, you know, leaving, leaving your toys in the, in the hallway so when the dad comes up in the middle of the night and he leaves early in the morning, he stumbles and falls and breaks his neck. Man, put your toys away. Why? Because you're thinking of your dad or your mom or your sibling. Over and over and over, think of those things. What can you do to make it easier? I'm just, this is child rearing. Teach your kids to turn the clothes right side out and untangled. When they put them in the dirty clothes. How about we start with teach your husband to do those things? So why, why would we do this? Because it makes it easier on others. It's about the wife or, who, or the husband, whoever does the laundry. I don't know, maybe your 12-year-old does the laundry. I have no idea. Number one, what did you do? What have you done this week for others? Passed out a track? That's simple. You say, well, I went to church. No, no, that's about you. These are your friends. You, you like hanging out together. How about this? There's some people yesterday went out and spent an hour, two, three hours visiting boys and girls that would never get a visit were it not for bus workers. And then they got here this morning early and got on a bus, and it's not cold yet. The real uh, Russell um, Tharp, he's in northern Minnesota or northern Michigan. I forget, he's way up north somewhere. I th maybe, I think it's northern Michigan. And uh, I texted him one morning and said, Hey, just went, you know, I'm praying for you. Hope you have a good morning. He said, Praise God, it's 10 below zero and every bus started. <laughs> I thought, Oh, 10 below zero on the bus. And buses don't have good heaters. But our workers got on buses this morning. Went out and picked up people, sometimes had to wake them up, 
got on the bus, got them here, walked the kids into class, got the kids back on the bus after Sunday school and after junior church. And then while we're eating lunch, they're still driving that bus out there, taking people home. You know what that's called? That's called living for others. That's truly living for others. That's dying. For those hours, the bus worker died to all the things they could have been doing. I was probably, we had some steak in the freezer we thought out and barbecued, and I, I was probably eating steak while there were still bus workers on their bus. I should feel terrible. I just think they'll get rewarded. Those, those buses out there, those are probably the nearest thing to the heart of God on this 16 acres. I guarantee you the devil hates the bus ministry. Because they, there's more people saved through the bus ministry than any other ministry. There's more people get loved that are unloved through the bus ministry than any other ministry. Now, I think our jails and rest homes are getting close in a very unique way, but we can't reach as many people with the jails and the rest homes as the buses. And that bus driver who for many, many years, we've got people who worked in the bus for 20, 30 years, um, the other night we gave awards out to Brother Williams and, and, and Miss Ryan, both of them 30, year, they, 30 years they'd worked in the bus. That's a lot of Sunday mornings not getting home till late. Anyway, those, the, how about the bus mechanics? You know what glory you get for working on a bus? Nothing. You're working on an old vehicle. You're busting your knuckles, and you're dirty. Uh, you know what that's called? That's called others. Now, I think singing in the choir is for others, but you know what? Some of you, you like it. Right? You know, you see Jerry and Phil up there. How do you do in a great, great morning? And, and we ought to enjoy singing in the choir. We ought to enjoy playing instruments. We ought, to enjoy, we ought to enjoy teaching Sunday school and all. But this thing of others says, you know what? I want you happy, and I will do whatever it takes to make sure your needs are met. I'll go ahead and find a way to get food to you. Say, nursery workers, they are living for others. Going to that nursery, taking, now, the other day, I don't know, a while back, I walked in, I don't know what it's like now, it's been a month or so, walked in nursery, there's two or three nursery workers and one baby. I said, man, this is sacrificial living. <laughs> They're in there watching YouTube, whatever, I don't know what they were doing. No, nursery worker, that's a lot. Others. Jesus is on the cross, and you know what his first thought? Hey, I want, Father, would you forgive those people? Then he sees his mother, and he says, I want to make sure you're taken care of. And, and, and then the thief next to him, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It's all about others. Our churches today are so selfish. Ask the average person why they go to church. Oh, you know, it just makes me feel so good. Oh, really? How about we go to the church makes God feel good? I don't see anywhere in the Bible. It says go to church because it makes you feel good. You know, you say, well, you know, I don't go to church because I don't, I don't feel comfortable there. Where in the Bible it says, says, yeah, I need to feel comfortable. You think the cross was comfortable? You know, I, the, that bus, that's a lot of hours. Not nearly as many hours as people are going to be in hell. And, and, and our Sunday school ministry, to sit up there, and uh, Clyde and Michelle, I know there are many like them, but 30 years teaching junior church or Sunday school class, and, and they've got kids of kids that go to their Sunday school class and teaching the Word of God, and how many how many things have they bought? Their class is like a smorgasbord from 7-Eleven or AMPM. There's nothing healthy in there, but piles of junk food in their class. The kids don't go there for the Bible lesson. They go there for the junk food. But others, others. I'll tell you what's living for others. It's going out soul winning. Because you know what? You go out on the streets talking to people about Christ, it's awkward, it's a chance to be embarrassed, it's a chance, and I'll tell you, sermons like this are why a lot of people would rather go to another church, because they can go to, and again, I'm not against other churches, I, I pray they just preach the gospel. I want whoever goes to these churches in our community to get saved, that's what I want. Uh, I would love them to learn to serve, learn to, to invest in others. I, look, how hard is it? I reach my pocket, I get a gospel track, say, hey, I want to give you a gospel track. This thing in the back, it'll tell you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. How hard is that? People get saved every week through the people, and, and then they'll never get to our church, but they hear the gospel. Work, public places, door to door, out in the streets, parks, 
carpools. People can say, why? Because somebody says, I am going to forget me. Look, most of you, it is awkward. You, think, you go up to knock on a door, you do this. They're not home. <laughs> yeah, going, going out soul winning, it's living for others. It's living for others. To get the gospel out. Tell you what, look at your wallet. Not right now. Look at your wallet. Look at your checkbook. Look at your financial statement. Ask yourself, is anything in my spending the last 30 days been totally for others? Tithes, offerings, given specific to missionaries, whatever it might be. Um, Doug Marco got an okay to go to back to the Philippines. And of course, got a big family, and uh, then they, they fly to the Philippines, and then they'll be they have to, they get put in a hotel for two weeks. They don't get to pick the hotel, and of course, it'll be in an economically feasible one with that's very clean, and has hot water. <laughs> That'll never happen. And um, then they're gonna after and they spend two weeks there, and then they'll fly to another island. And they'll have to quarantine there for two weeks probably as well. Brother Marco said, I probably need ten thousand dollars to get back to church. So I said, well, we got money. We're gonna, I said, I'm going to send you $500 right off. Guess who has that $500? And guess whose wallet it's in? Uh, we took an offering the other day to help with Nate and Tara. Uh, she had an emergency appendectomy down in Chile, and um, we helped get a, a, a car to, to um, Joe Wynn down in uh, wherever, down in, in Ensenada. Uh, and... Uh, and I told him, we're going to send you a couple thousand dollars to cover expenses and transfers, any repairs that you need, and help out with things. And uh, guess who's got that $2,000? Uh, that's us. You know what that's called? That's called others. So, you know, mentally or whatever, pull your wallet out, pull your checkbook out sometime, look at your financial statement, look at your computer or whatever, and just step back. And, and, and you might be able to do it mentally. What of the money I spent has been thoroughly, completely for others? And if you can't think of anything, then we need to fix it. Because this sitting here is not church, not Bible church, not, Christ, not Bible Christianity, unless we do something about what's out there. I got a picture of Miss Pat with Brooklyn Beale sort of on her lap, sort of leaning on her, and they're looking at a picture book together. That's others. And every Sunday school teacher in here, that's, that's that way. I wonder, how about your car? Has your car ever picked up anybody for church? I remember one of our families years ago, you that have been here a long time, you remember the Dunn Street ladies? I don't remember their names. They were the Dunn Street ladies. Why you call them that? Because they live on Dunn Street. And there are two sisters that lived in the dirtiest home. I mean, the dirtiest home. And we traded off picking them up. And uh, different of us pick them up. And uh, I remember one Sunday picking them up. We had a van, and, and I picked them up, and, and Josh was with me. Josh was a little, I don't, know, I don't know how little, but I'm going to say 17, 18. No, he was <laughs> five or six years old, and he was right behind me. And they got, and it was wintertime. It was cold. And uh, they get in the van, and van door shuts, and we're driving, and I hear the window pop open right behind me. And I thought, what are you, I started to correct him, and I saw the window pop open, and he had his nose, right, <laughs> right, it smelled so bad in that van. One of our, I remember one of our families, they picked him up, I went by their house on the, one of our members, other, not the Dunn Street lady, but by someone else's home, I don't know why I went by their house on the way home, it was out of my way, but I'm driving by their house, and their seats were out of their van, on the driveway, in the sun. Because they just smelled. I mean, one trip to and from church, and they had to take those seats, and they left them out there for several days. I wonder what Jesus felt on that cross. You know, we have, and tell you what, um, we, we had, I won't call his name, but we had a, a guy in our church that was unusually upholstered, and... Uh, and, and, you, and, and not bathed very often and, and um, he was in a he came for a long time and then he got sick and was in a convalescent home and I went by to see him 
and I found out two of our finest ladies had driven all the way to Hemet to see that guy who was dirty and smelled and had no family, no friends. Now that's Christianity. You know, any, anybody will visit their friends, but who will visit those without friends? Who will we pick up in our car? Do I want my children to make a lot of money or do I want my children to make a difference? Do I want my family, my marriage, do I want us to, you know, have this cushy retirement? See, I'm 64 and I'm thinking I've got all the money laid out just right so by the time we're 66, I should be able to have X income and X meaning zero. <laughs> have, we, have we thought about that retirement and, and I'm for you know the just man proverb says lays up an inheritance for his children's children I am for being prudent but not selfish do I want to retire comfortable or do I want to retire useful do I only love people with money or are there people uh, are there, is there anyone in the world who's poor who knows you love them? I'll tell you, those Sunday school kids know somebody loves them. You know, these kids are so funny. They get on that bus, and they think the bus driver is the greatest person in the world. They don't realize it's just us. But every week they see that driver. And um, we, in, we in our churches in America and our country as a whole have cultivated a very me world and it's not bible and i want to challenge you young people live for others our preacher back in indiana he used to go through the song over and over lord let me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when i kneel to pray my prayer should be for others have you prayed for others have you given for others have you invested your time for others and just say this with this bus ministry we need bus work we don't just need buses but it would sure be good to have a couple of new buses at $30,000 or $25,000 a piece. But we don't just need buses. See, a new bus means a new driver and mechanics and bus workers and someone to visit the kids. And then it means teachers because somebody's got to teach those kids. You bring in two or 300 kids, somebody better teach them or they're going to go crazy. It, the whole ministry to the poor and the needy is others. We have a several million dollar animal shelter right over here. And it just kills me to see that when nowhere in this valley is there a home for homeless human beings. That's a tragedy. That is a slander against our community that we've built a somebody, I don't know who, built a several million dollar animal complex while human beings sleep on the street. Others. Let's don't forget that. Father, help us to keep the reminder in front of us that we ought to live for others. Husbands and wives should live that way. Parents should teach children to live that way. The me first should never happen. Uh, the uh, I want the best needs to be trained out of our kids. But here at our church, Lord, we, if we have a choice between the poor and the rich, may we choose the poor. If we have a choice between the homeless and the affluent, may the homeless know they're loved and they're welcome. I just ask for help, Lord, for the buses, for the bus ministry, for the Sunday school ministry. Lots and lots of people, they know a lot of Bible, and it would be so easy to be a Sunday school teacher. It would be sacrificial of some time. So many of us understand the gospel and we could witness we could pass out gospel tracts. We could invite people to church and tell them how to get saved. If we would. It would be great to have a dozen buses going out picking people up and then having a dozen or 20 new Sunday school teachers teaching those young people and then have soul winners to go out and meet their parents and let them know somebody cares about them. Lord, would you help us to live for others? We just need you, Lord. We need to not be a selfish church. We're in a selfish society. 
This culture is all about self. But may we be different, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together for a moment with our heads bowed. All